This week on the show, we're featuring two interviews. First up, you'll hear from Freeway, a houseless activist in Oakland, California, about the recent series of sweeps of homeless communities being promoted by Governor Gavin Newsom. Freeway has been a member of the Wood Street Commons and is now a member of the Oakland Homeless Union. Then Janet of Rural Organizing and Resilience, or ROAR, in Madison County speaks about post-Hurricane Helene organizing and disaster preparedness in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Members of Asheville Community Bail Fund have announced a phone zap concerning conditions in the Buncombe County Detention Center, where reports are coming out of the lack of clean water, irregular bathroom breaks, and other lack of access that are leading to calls for those in the jail to be released or transferred to a facility with more humane conditions. You can find in our notes more information about this phone zap or on the Instagram for the Asheville Community Bail Fund. And for anyone who's interested, there apparently was a benefit album for Helene Recovery that features bands such as War on Drugs, R.E.M., and Fish and a bunch of other projects, 136 different songs released on there. And the benefit goes to a bunch of different projects in the area, including rural organizing and resilience and Appalachian Medical Solidarity and other groups. And you can find more by looking up the album Cardinals at the Window. My name's Freeway. I am uh, I go by they, them. Um, and I'm with Wood Street Commons, as well as the newly formed Oakland Homeless Union. Yeah, thanks a lot for ha- taking time to chat. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, you said the second group is the Oakland um, Homeless Coalition. Is that Homeless Union? Cool. Yeah. I'll want to ask about that then. Um, so we're basically, um, we're a newly formed organization. We are a group of either unhoused or form or formerly unhoused, like newly housed individuals that, um, basically are just organizing to fight back. The city has, and the state have issued a lot of policies that are really, not in our favor and so we're just trying to uh have our voices heard and and yeah cool and so like the name would denote to me that it's it's folks that are currently like in some sort of precarious housing situation whether like living in vehicles or living in tents or maybe in shelters or on people's couches like how do you define homelessness in this basically anybody that is housing insecure that could be couch surfing, that could be, like you mentioned, in a shelter, um, in a tent, on the street, in a car. And, and really, you know, even those who are newly housed or that are housed but housing insecure, we're trying to actually align with some of the tenants unions out here as well. Just because what people don't realize oftentimes is that even though you're housed, that doesn't mean anything. You're, we're all one check away, as, as most of us that have been unhoused for some time know. It doesn't take very much, and especially in California, the rent is so high, and the property value is so high out here. It's very difficult to find affordable affordable living situations. So. And we had mentioned the Wood Street Commons. Could you, I, there was a physical location for that, hence the name, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that project, what it has done, and maybe what it continues to do if it's not in that space anymore? Sure. So um, just to back up a little bit and give a little bit of a history lesson. So the name Wood Street Commons comes from our first central location. We were living at 1707 Wood Street, and over the span of about a decade, the city ushered a lot of people down to Wood Street. In fact, many of us were told specifically by law enforcement, by other city officials. You know, if, if you just go down to Wood Street, you won't be messed with. So a lot of us did. And then over that span of time, we sort of organically formed this community and we filled in the gaps where the city wasn't serving people, basically. We had a community kitchen. We had a free store. We had lifelong medical that would come and do medical visits right there on site. And so, and we had like donations were dropped off there. People knew that, you know, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter when they showed up, where they came from, how much they had, how much they didn't have. 
if they showed up at Wood Street, they would have their needs met. They would be fed. They'd have a safe place to be. And so in about June of 2022, the city started the first tier of evictions. By the time they came to evict us, we had expanded to about three city blocks long and um, approximately a little over 300 people were living there. And so when they started the evictions at the north end of, of our community, that was about June 2022, we were in and out of court for a while. We reached out and had volunteers come down and do, you know, eviction defense with us. And, and we fought a good fight, but eventually it came to an end in April of 2023. And so when that happened, many of us were forced either to relocate on the streets or a good portion of us actually were forced into the tiny sheds or what they call here, the community cabins. We like to call them the tiny tombs. And the conditions were deplorable, so much so that the, the architect of them actually reached out to us and was like, I've made a serious mistake. What can I do to make this you know, better? And we'll get to that in a minute. But basically, we were watching these so-called service providers rake in millions off the backs of services that were supposed to be provided to us that weren't being provided. We, were, we didn't have toilet paper. We didn't have drinking water. Um, there were ADA violations constantly. I mean, just you name it. It was There was abuse of uh, from the staff. I physically was assaulted by a staff member more than once. I mean, just just the worst conditions. And we couldn't get the city to take us seriously. It didn't matter how much we we went to city council, we raised these concerns, we talked about it on news shows, it didn't matter. So instead of sitting around and waiting for the city to do something, we decided to get together and get our 501c3 and just continue what we had been doing at Wood Street, which is, you know, feeding people, clothing people, informing people of their rights, and just organizing our community. And we've kept on with that since. As I mentioned, we now have our 501c3 and our main two focuses are the outreach team, which I have a lot to do with that. And also our vision for the self-sustaining community that we're in talks with. We're in negotiations with the city right now of, of getting a plot of land for that. And basically it, it's an expansion of what we already had at Wood Street. It's self-run by the people that live there, um, self-governed, and it has everything you could possibly imagine. Um, there's vocational opportunities, there's educational opportunities, we have a harm reduction clinic, there's a there's living for there's living situations for families with kids, there's housing for people who are single or for couples. A portion of it is for R V dwellers. Yeah, just very comprehensive, very service rich. And the best thing about it is that every person that lives there, when they come there, they we take the time to figure out like what their niche is, where their strengths are, how they can contribute to the community. And so each person that comes in finds that that place, finds their role, and then they pass along that knowledge to the next people that come in. So it's sort of like this, you know, each one teach one sort of mentality. And in doing so, it creates uh, job opportunities. It creates living opportunities. Like people learn life skills in doing this. And it also offer, offers us the opportunity to maintain this community with um, with less of a uh, worry about like overhead and things like that. So it's um, we're very excited about it. We've been working on it for a while now with uh, the architect Mike Pytalk, who is actually the architect of the tiny sheds that I mentioned before. Um, this was sort of his way of reaching out to us and and you know making things right that the city messed up so so i guess like keeping on the wood street commons project like the 
I think the the name of it is pretty interesting and it seems to really fulfill this. So like the commons were this this part of communities that were protected by common law in what is now the UK, in England at least, where everyone would go collect what they needed, um, share resources, share fields, um, you know, have their animals grazing or whatever. It was like a commonly held and protected community resource that was privatized through the enclosure movement which which you know displaced communities uh displaced individuals and and push people into into factory jobs or like out of criminalize them and push them out of the country like i think that like got them sent on ships to the u.s for the colonies or to australia or, or to, to canada or whatever so i think like that name is really interesting i wonder if you could talk a little bit about like when y'all were coming up with that name what you were thinking about so I'm going to be honest, I was not there for the naming part, but I do, it, it does resonate with me that the meaning of commons and like you were talking about how, how it was supposed to mean something that was like protected and, and served the community and, and was shared within the community and then ultimately was privatized. That's pretty much exactly what happened with 1707. We had a safe space that we were told by the powers that be like we could be there and nobody would mess with us and ultimately what ended up happening is they did displace over 300 people and and very violently so um it's a very sad fact but in the time since we've been evicted from 1707 wood street we've actually buried more of our community members than we've seen housed that's a trend that continues to show up and it's showing up even more now with Governor Newsom's executive order and with grants pass being issued. And I mean, we're really seeing the negative effects of the privatization of land. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about about the executive order and the we can skip around and, and move over to that question about like what the Supreme Court said and and how it's been enacted by Governor Newsom, Democratic Governor Newsom? Yeah, Democratic. That's a scary idea. So the, uh, the well, let me start with Grants Pass, I guess, because Grants Pass was ruled on in, I believe, June, if I'm not mistaken. And basically what Grants Pass decision meant for us is that now, whereas before we had pr- certain protections, cities had to offer a certain amount of services when they conducted sweeps, as they're so inappropriately called. And that was in place because of Martin versus Boise, which was a court case that basically said, if a, if a city is going to evict someone that's unhoused, they have to offer adequate shelter. Well, when Grants Pass got ruled on by the Trump appointed Supreme Court, that overturned Martin versus Boise. So all of a sudden you see this uptick in intensity and in frequency of these sweeps. Then very shortly after that, Governor Newsom puts out his executive order, which stated that not only was he saying that he would allow sweeps to continue and to increase, he was actually ordering cities to sweep all homeless encampments. When that happened, all of a sudden you saw a, ch- a very drastic change pretty much overnight. Now you're seeing policies in places like in all over California where it's a misdemeanor to be unhoused. They're using terms like, you know, camping paraphernalia and fining people and arresting people you can spend up to a month in jail for being unhoused. And if you have priors and you get arrested, it could be up to a $10,000 bail. And like the thing is, what happens when those people get arrested? What do, when they come out of jail, are they healthy? Are they whole? Are they housed? And the answer is no. Nothing, nothing positive comes from this. And nobody is seeing an uptick in services being offered. They're not seeing an uptick in people being housed, just in the criminalization of the unhoused. Yeah, it's 
it's been and, and also a criminalization of the volunteers that are helping the advocates that are showing up to sweeps and and putting their their freedom their safety on the line because you have places like oakland where we have a, a safe work zone ordinance so now all they have to do is show up with 30 cops and a couple of dpw workers and they say oh this is a safe work zone now well, if that safe work zone is your home, is your tent with all your belongings in it, once they put up that yellow tape or that fence or whatever, you can't go in there. You can't grab any of your belongings. I've heard of people's medicine being thrown out, their wheelchairs being thrown out, the remains of their their dead loved ones. I it's really struggled to say that out loud. Um, so, and the people that are showing up to advocate for them are being arrested. People who are showing up to document this, the journalists are being arrested. And that's really scary. Yeah, that's really traumatic. So like this, the state is dealing with people not having secure shelter or housing by criminalizing it and then releasing people, like destabilizing people, breaking up communities further, taking away people's means towards survival. And then if they get arrested, redepositing them on the street Mm -hmm. which doesn't seem to like it that's not yeah as you say it's like not offering a solution it's not saying well here's a place to go it's saying stop stop existing i guess yeah well and 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 the thing is like let's let's not let's not get it twisted the cities in that are doing this the, the 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 entities that are at the hands of this aren't really looking for a solution. If they were, they would have brought the unhoused community and those who were most directly impacted by these policies to the table a long time ago. They would have offered sanitation or porta potties, you know, a long time ago. Instead, it's much easier for them to create this situation where there is a ton of trash on the street because they won't come and collect it. There is fecal matter and and urine in the street because they won't offer bathrooms. It's easier to then demonize the faction of people that they're trying to have a negative view of. And then you can justify putting somebody in jail. You can justify 5150ing somebody. Which for folks out of California, can you describe? I was going to say for just to clarify, that's involuntary commitment. Um, They put you on a 70 tower hold. And that's another tactic that we're seeing a a lot more of is, you know, people who are in a traumatizing situation, who are watching all of their belongings be crushed up in a garbage truck, who are surrounded by 30 some odd cops with guns and, you know, billy clubs, and they're threatening to arrest them and they're they're sitting there and antagonizing them. Of course, you're going to have an emotional reaction. Of course, you're going to be upset and be angry and they're doing these things and then antagonizing people who are already in a vulnerable situation and then when they react in an emotional way then they're 51 ing them they're involuntarily committing them also trying to do these uh psych evaluations on site as all this is happening which makes no sense whatsoever nobody's going to be in a in a rational state of mind when they're losing everything they own so it's just it's really just more cruelty for the sake of creating an enemy and when when people do find like short-term housing that's available like those cabins that you were talking about like that like one of the elements of this obviously like i'm sure that there's a lot of just just, uh cruelty approach that is about just getting people out of sight or punishing people for being destabilized or going through a hard time or having a different reality like around mental mental health or addiction or, or or whatever that happens to be access to resources for language barriers what have you but can you talk a little bit about what short-term solutions are being offered and like like if they build these small cabins are they outside of city centers away from the eyes of tourists and business people and like also very far away from resource access or how does that work? I know like there's a pretty like robust transit system for the Bay area compared to a lot of other places around the country. 
There is, and and it should be noted. I don't think it's possible for them to have found a more out of the way, more um, isolated area to put these cabins. Like they literally picked the only sections of the city where there isn't really a bus uh, line nearby, or it is difficult to really get to any services. And whereas, the like I know from experience with our time in the cabins, the grant proposal, we've actually seen the grant proposal that was written for the money to open these cabins, $8.3 million was awarded to open these cabins. Amongst the services, there was supposed to be housing navigation, job readiness, help with getting your, uh, your documents so you can be housed, mental health services, a computer lab, I mean, you name it. Literally none of the services, none of the programs that were in that grant proposal ever came to fruition, at least not while I was there. And to my understanding, they're still not implemented. However, the director of this program, actually, I, I should say he was the director. He's since then been fired and I believe is actually on the run from being investigated. But he was notorious for bragging about being, you know, spending 14 days in Belize. I've actually got a video of him coming back from vacation and like boasting about being 14 days in Belize. He would always show up to the cabins driving one of two luxury vehicles he owned, one of them being a Maserati. So you, you see the pattern here, like we can't have toilet paper, but you can drive a Maserati. There's a problem there. And that's par for the course. Many of the people that exist in this homeless industrial complex have salaries that would house everybody in Hopeland. If we took the money that we were spending on the sweeps and paying for these individuals to conduct these sweeps, we could absolutely house every single unhoused person in Oakland. And I'm not talking about like in a tiny tomb, I'm talking about actual housing. You mentioned the everyone being a paycheck away from this sort of like housing destabilization and that makes a lot of sense and it's really cool to hear about the 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 homeless union. Can you so every everyone obviously who becomes homeless has a personal story of what brought them to where they are today, but the shared spaces of those stories is what could be called like a social story. It's I mean, it's definitely individualized, but also it paints a bigger picture when you can pick and pull elements of those and see where they overlap. Can you talk about houselessness as a social condition, about how formerly housed folks become houseless and some of the popular misconceptions around that, like around questions of like safety for the individuals who are houseless or, or the communities that they're in or addiction, agency, health, those sort of things? Sure. So just for starters, I think it's really important for anybody who's listening to this, who's not from California, to understand that the rent out here is too damn high, period. I don't, there's no real other way to say it than just that. It cost a fortune to live out here. I was actually in a, in a conference, I think sometime last year, and they were showing uh, like a, like on a bar graph, how much it cost to pay for rent in Oakland, like the average rent and the average income for an adult who's not disabled, just, you know, and it actually, the, the cost of rent was about the same height. It was about double the height on the bar chart. So, and I, and I forget the exact like numbers there, but basically that, that kind of shows you like in a picture how high it is out here. Everything is more expensive. It's not just the rent. And so when you have a place like this where the rent's too high, the cost of living's too high, and people are not making enough, obviously that's going to contribute to the situation. On top of that, Basically, this is what I was talking about before, the homeless industrial complex. Once you have people who are becoming unhoused, 
these service providers are making millions off of keeping us in the cycle of getting housed, not actually housing us, just in the cycle of providing quote unquote services, quote unquote outreach. In fact, I'll put it to you this way. The organization that is contracted by the city to do outreach for encampments that are about to be closed. I don't even, I'm, I'm not going to say their name, just, but their outreach is they show up either the day before the sweep or the day or the morning of. They approach people with a stale bag of chips and at, at most. They might have like a couple of other, you know, food items. For the most part, it's usually like a bag of chips. And they will offer, they'll say, do you want to take shelter? They won't explain what that shelter is. If, if you have like ADA issue, like um, you have a disability and you need reasonable accommodations, they won't work with you. It's basically yes or no, do you want shelter? No details about what that is. If you say no, then you are labeled shelter resistant. Once you're labeled shelter resistant, it's you might as well be labeled with a scarlet letter at that point because it becomes that much harder. The police, when they come to do the closures, will target you specifically. It's just like this ongoing cycle. These sweeps are so traumatic that once you've been through one, it knocks you off. You're you, like it, it traumatizes you. You there are a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of false narratives. Like you hear people say all the time, oh well, you know, people don't want to take shelter. They just want to stay out and you know use drugs or um, they don't want to follow rules. That's why they want to take shelter. First of all, there's about one shelter bed for every four unhoused individuals in the state of California. So even if they had the swankiest, most service rich shelters, there would still not be enough of them. That's the first issue. Secondly, just to speak to the you know comment about they, they all just want to use drugs, that mindset, that 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 division, that dichotomy is so dangerous. And it's something that you hear on both sides. You know what I mean? People will say, and even in the unhoused community, like, oh, I'm not your usual homeless person. I don't do drugs. That is such a dangerous mindset to have. There are some people out here that use, they use to self-medicate. And they're no more, they're just as, their life is just as valuable as the person next to them that doesn't use. And allowing that, that division, that dichotomy to exist and not to check it is really dangerous. The words that people use in relation to how they speak about people who run house. I was in a city council meeting not long ago and we were actually discussing the closure of two encampments that are in Berkeley. They're the only two in Berkeley. And I kept hearing people say that we're about, they were trying to push the closure through Oh, these are the two most dangerous encampments in Berkeley. Well, they're the only two. And so, and and they would use words like, like eradicate and calling people dangerous. And it really upset me that that was allowed to go on. You don't eradicate human beings. And I can honestly tell you, in my entire time being unhoused, I have scarcely felt truly in danger ever anywhere I've been on the streets. My friend that does advocacy, she's actually a housed individual, but she always tells people when, when they ask her like, oh, you, you don't feel dangerous walking around by yourself? She says, no, because when you have people's backs and you actually listen to them and you befriend them, they have your back too. You know what I mean? It's this idea that people are dangerous just because they live outside is actually in and itself dangerous. And I, I think also that there's this misconception that danger is being confused for discomfort. You know, you've got all these people that are living now across from 1707 that blow up the the complaint line. So it's, it, out here it's 311. 
and I mean, dozens a day of this, you know, this guy set up a camp here, da, 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 and, and just exaggerated, ridiculous, very untrue recollections of what's actually going down in front of their house. And what I've realized from that is that, you know, these people are uncomfortable. They're not comfortable sitting in their house and seeing somebody else unhoused, and they shouldn't be. It's an, it's very, it is very sad state of affairs that we live in one of the richest states in the United States, and people are suffering like they are. So yes, you should be uncomfortable, but that's not the same thing as not being safe. And that that just that distinction needs to be made. I think also to the point of the, like, everyone's using drugs, drugs make people unsafe. Like, I'm sure some people may be self-medicating. Some people may be unable to control an addiction. That's also the case with lots of housed people. They just happen exactly. to have the resources and they're doing it behind walls or they're paying to do it in a public space like a bar and you yeah. don't have a complaint. I mean, I live in a town that, that uh, up until the recent floods has been well known for its number of breweries and its tourist industry. And people come into town and just like stumble down the street all the time. You know, it's neighborhoods that are known for, at this point, having just a ton of bars and a ton of breweries and people wandering down the street drunk. But the complaints don't come out about those folks because they're getting into an Uber and going to an Airbnb somewhere. Yep. And that sort of like double awareness of it's okay for these people to be self-medicating or be intoxicated and right. enjoying the substances versus right. these other people because it makes you embarrassed or uncomfortable is just, it's, I think, a big hurdle for people to get over. It is. And I mean, also, if you're going to talk about, you know, if you're going to talk about the contrast and the comparisons, I mean, how many people are on some kind of medication, some kind of antidepressant, some kind of, you know, Ritalin or, or you know, whatever, and they're dependent on that. I'm not. I'm not comparing opiates necessarily to Ritalin. But I'm just saying, a chemical dependency is a chemical dependency, whichever way you cut it. And there's lots of things that people who are housed, and and it's not just exclusive to to chemical use. They, I mean, people talk about hoarding all the time, um, you know. And I, the the architect we were speaking about earlier made an excellent point one day when we were talking. Somebody said, well, how are you going to control the hoarding? And he said, hoarding is really not the issue. The issue is people don't have a place to put it all. People in houses hoard too. That's why you have attics and basements. And when, like, that was the first time I really understood, like, he's absolutely right. This, and that's true in so many other ways too. People who are, un who are unhoused are simply exposed. You've kind of already gone through this, but in terms of infrastructure that does exist or that people have the option sometimes to be able to access like the the um, tiny house or tiny tomb set up there and like that Oakland has been providing. Can you talk about some of the barriers that people who are able to get access to a program that would get them transitional housing um, or public housing or vouchers? Like that sort of stuff, like how, well, let's say somebody, somebody is on the street and they want to get out of the situation. I know it's going to be a lot of different things that are going to be figuring into it, but assuming that they don't have real access to like generational wealth, like family that can help stabilize them or friends that they can sleep on couches, like how hard is it to get into transitional housing? Does it, is it dependent on what sort of like criminal history that might be related to homelessness that you have, that sort of stuff? Surprisingly enough, and this is from this is from the mouth of basically the person in charge of homelessness issues in Oakland, according to the report she just gave, or the report that she was supposed to give, the uh, in lieu of having that report, she gave a few excuses, and along the in the in that conversation, she did say that you know they really don't do background checks um oftentimes it's actually pretty uncommon so that's really not so much the issue the issues that keep people from 
being put into transitional housing more often than not are just the lack of beds. Um, that's overwhelmingly the issue. Past that, a lot of them are inaccessible. There's a lot of people out here that are on the streets that are disabled or they have some sort of disability um, in one way or another. And these, these shelters don't really cater to that. And besides that, they don't really make it accessible for you, truthfully. For example, there was um, this past week, or this uh, about a week ago, there was another major closure of another community, and two of the individuals had been told about this. You know, there were two openings at one of the cabin communities. They said, "Absolutely, we'll take it." Got in the van, went with them to you know do the intake, and they got there, and there was no openings. And they said, okay, well, I guess, you know, we'll try again later, turn around and came back. And by the time they came back, everything was destroyed. What do you do at that point? You know what I mean? That That's disheartening. It takes your faith in the people that are supposed to be helping you and just smashes it. And things like that happen all the time. People are, I mean, girls are trafficked out of some of these places. People are abused in every which way you can think of it's yeah it's um that's really where the barriers lie is is in the lack of the lack of quality I, I like to try to end conversations towards like sort of like where do we go from here like what are some helpful things and and especially when it's like people who are most affected having agency in that decision making so that like that the union that you were talking about that would be working with some of the tenants unions also, because that's such a, that's such like a divide that doesn't need to be there between those two organizing um, frameworks. I wonder if uh, you could talk a bit about what the union's doing, like what's, how it engages, how, how meetings happen that you can talk about and sort of like groups, tenants unions that you're also working with. So, so I just need to clarify when I mentioned the tenants unions earlier, um, that was more in re- reference to something that we would like to see happen. That's not currently something that's happening at this point. The homeless union, the, the local that I'm a part of, is still very, very new. We've just started. And very shortly after we started, uh, our friends in Berkeley that are like one city away started up theirs too. So we're kind of like growing together. Um, it's still very new. Check back with me in about six months and I'll, I'll be able to give you a better answer than that. Cool. Are there any models of groups that you all are sort of basing it off of? Like I remember back in, back like 20, maybe like 30 years ago in Ontario, there was this really interesting leftist working class organizing group called OCAP, the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. And that that's just like one group. But um, yeah, I, I wonder if, yeah, you could talk about like what inspirations you have or, or what steps you're hoping to take. So um, we have, a, I personally have a lot of positive influences. Some of my mentors are in other organizations that do similar types of organizing. Just to name a couple, uh, the Love and Justice in the Streets is another grassroots organization here. And Boots is one of my like all-time heroes. The League of Revolutionaries partner with us. Um, we've, they've done some organizing with us. Uh, let's see. Um, Homefulness, Poor Magazine. I don't know if you've heard of, of Tiny and them, but... They're also really close to us. We they're like extended family, and the the poor people pe- poor people's campaign. These you know, just to name a few, um, the people that are in these organizations like uh, Miss Kimberly King, um, Nell Myhand, all of these really strong women have I've somehow found their way into my life and I've been able to learn a lot from them and I'm still learning. Also the, the other homeless unions like the Sac- Sacramento Homeless Union, Crystal Sanchez is an amazing superhero woman. <laughs> I don't know how she does everything she does, but yeah, there's, there's definitely quite a, 
a large pot to draw strength and inspiration from and and uh, they've all been really really influential cool is there anything that i mean there's a lot i'm sure but is there anything that i didn't ask about that maybe you wanted to touch on or that occurs to you now um because we still got a little bit of time if i don't mention the bike ride john's gonna strangle me (laughs) one of the things that we do every year is we have this annual bike ride and we go from we ride from oakland to sacramento there's a little bit of history there, but just to save time, I'll, I'll fast forward. This is our third annual one, and we are leaving out Friday. And the goal is to ride our bikes to Sacramento, and we should get there by Sunday evening. And once we get there Monday morning, we have a huge rally planned at the Capitol. We're also planning on, we've got a few meetings with different representatives lined up and we're just gonna bend their ear and discuss with them you know why the policies that are in place are not working and what we would like to see them do differently um and uh yeah make some noise that on the capitol steps (laughs) i think it's really important for people that are in the listening audience to recognize that like as I understand, Newsom is is like coordinating to work towards a presidential bid, and we like moved from being mayor of San Francisco um, under some sketchy circumstances, as I understand, then up through governor, and is uh, this is some like is is this what people if they're gonna if they're gonna be voting for a federal policy is this the kind of thing that they want is the federal policy where it's obviously putting profits of property owners uh which is a minority of of the general population over the well-being of communities and whole swaths of of the population that any of us who's listening to this and paying attention could become a part of like is just not (laughs) it's 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 not the kind of future that i want it's not something that democrats or whoever should be proud of right Um, and and that's the scary thing is to like all the people that we're talking about, Governor Newsom, Mayor Shang Tao of Oakland, London Breed in San Francisco, all of these people are supposed to be the Democrats. They're supposed to be the quote unquote progressive ones. And they're pushing just as hard for basically the erasure of an entire population of people. That terrifies me. Like if that's what the, the Democrats are doing, what the hell is in store with the Republicans? You know what I mean? Or the more the more right wing. That's an absolutely terrifying thought. Well, yeah, Freeway, thank you for having this conversation. Uh, I really appreciate it. And um, good luck with the bike ride. Yeah. And if you want to send any sort of um, organizational links or any other, if any other groups occur to you or places where people can keep up with um, perspectives of people that are experiencing houselessness or, or houseless destabilization who are talking about these issues. I'm like, I'd happy to be happy to like populate the show notes with that stuff. Certainly. Um, I'll also send you. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Welcome to Maltop Now, a podcast about taking action. In Molotov Now, we analyze and discuss news articles and stories of resistance from around the globe and connect them to our struggles here at home in Aberdeen, Washington. In the spirit of building solidarity between the rural and the urban, we hope to inspire direct action in the face of oppression and to light a fire to find each other in the darkness. I'm Janet, and I use she, her pronouns. I live and work in Madison County in Western North Carolina. Uh, I live about an hour from Asheville, honestly, but um, the place where my classroom and clinic is is about 30 minutes from Asheville for people who are considering the geography here. Uh, I'm from the foothills of this area and my mom's family are from Spruce Pine. So I'm, and my dad's family are from the foothills. So my whole family on both sides are basically within the flood zone. So I'm personally connected as well as being living here now. Um, And I've lived in Madison County, or I I bought land with some friends about 20 years ago and have lived here full time since 2008. Um, 
And I work, but the reason I'm here to talk to you is that I organize with Rural Organizing and Resilience, and we are working on regional local disaster relief in the face of Hurricane Helene. I'm not sure how you're pronouncing that hurricane's name. I like to give it a little flourish there. Um, yeah, it's got the E on the end. I think it's Helene. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and then it tells them that they're pronouncing Appalachia wrong, so it's... Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot for taking the time to to be here for this. So I wonder if you could talk, you mentioned ROAR, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the history of ROAR and um, other any, any other like formations you want to mention that you work with in Madison County. Sure. Uh, yes. So just as far as the history of ROAR goes, uh, some of the relevant information that I think is actually pretty important to the level to which we've been able to be quickly responding to the current situation is that a uh, few of us founded Roar back in like winter of 2016, 2017. So, you know, post election and the white supremacist vibes were ramping up really hard that year. It was really intense. There was a lot of open white supremacist organizing in the mountains happening. And so we actually formed Roar originally as uh, more focused on anti-racist action and trying to create systems of safety with he here in the county and in Western North Carolina in the mountains. So that was the original point, but you know, it's just been one disaster after another following that year. And we still have an anti-racist focus, but we shifted a lot of our work into doing more mutual aid work, especially once 2020 hit and the pandemic got rolling and a lot of people were out of work out here. There was very little safety net for people. And so we set up a distribution center then and did food deliveries, water deliveries, resource deliveries, medication deliveries that whole year almost. And some of the people delivering for us now delivered back then as well. And so that was big um, and also just helped us understand how to run a distribution site from moving through that. And we also have a firewood distribution setup. And so one of the main needs of this area, a lot of people use wood heat, which is more reliable sometimes, but you need to be able-bodied unless you're buying firewood to be able to collect firewood. So we have a group of folks who collect firewood, process it, and deliver it. And that's been a pretty solid distribution um, activity and resource that we've been supplying this county with for a few years now. And we've been able to get some grants to buy equipment and stuff, which are coming in really handy now. Because now we're able to actually collect firewood that's down, like trees that are down by the road and stuff, you know? And we're collecting firewood for this winter, which is probably gonna be a hard one for a lot of people around here, you know? And I guess I should also say that uh, we're connected to holler harm reduction. And that's been a really important resource. They, they help serve the community who need safe use supplies around here and a lot of good contacts out in the county, but also they have a space and they're a nonprofit. And really, I don't know where we would be this week if it hadn't been for the support of holler harm reduction. So I do want to say that as well. Um, they've just been indispensable. And we're also connected to the Asheville Tool Library. They've been so helpful. And um, yeah, just I guess I could, I'll stop there because I know we need to get more into the details in a bit. But I will say that these years of already organizing and already having distribution networks has been so helpful for responding quickly to this situation. Yeah, and I'd like to hear more shout outs at the end too. But sure. It, just to kind of go off script for a second with the question, like it, sure. so Roar and in Buncombe County, the Blue Ridge ABC chapter, and then also in wider, like Western North Carolina, and then expanded out from there, Appalachian Medical Solidarity, which I think mm -hmm. at the time, like these are a few formations that developed out of people with skills reacting to the general like world that was connected yeah. to this election right and that time frame right um, right and the fact that they've continued is like really awesome and i think that also while like you can point to a political critique that's present in groups like this that have been around for this period of time i wonder if you mm -hmm. can speak about the wider participation from community members who don't consider themselves radical or like radical mm -hmm. leftists or right. whatever did you put down a flag and say this is our ideology come to us or Mm -hmm. um, you like made it about the activity, but also sort of kept it within a certain zone of 
mm-hmm. we're not going to work with Nazis for like pretty right, much. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. You know, one thing that's true in these rural Appalachian communities is there is a lot, people feel very judged by outsiders and they see people who haven't lived here for a very long time as outsiders. So <laughs> some of us are from nearby, but most of us are not. So there's like a couple people from like right here, but most of us are not. And so we we knew going into this that we had to be cautious not to use language that would make people feel shamed or judged while at the same time being like we are anti-racist, right? And honestly, in the beginning, we were called Rural Organizing Against Racism. And using that in our name alone meant people thought, hated them and didn't want to talk to them, you know. And so the shift to rural organizing and resilience while still doing a lot of anti-racist work has been really helpful because... It's allowed us to emphasize shared values like community care. You know, people here are very self-sufficient. There's a big emphasis on self-sufficiency. There's also an emphasis on helping your neighbors and caring for each other. Mutual aid is part of the culture here because this is a place where people have been very poor and very, and, and definitely neglected. Like these are not people who are have access to most of the kinds of services or any safety net as they exist in the world, which there's not a lot of that anyway at this point. And so there's a pride in caring for self here and for caring for community. And there's an ethic for that. And generally, you know, Western North Carolina is a little funny. Like it, it's not as Trumpy as a lot of the state. Like it's not as hostile feeling as a lot of places are. I'm from the foothills and, and even between those two places, it's pretty different. And so we still try to have any racist messaging in our front and center, but we don't talk about politics. We definitely don't talk about electoral politics. And we also... We use some talking points that anarchists would recognize, (laughs) but we don't actually use the A word openly out in the world. And everyone in our group is not an anarchist. And there's all kinds of folks, you know, there are definitely, I'm not going to name all the affiliations. There's many kinds of people uh, that are part of the group. And what we just try to do is emphasize the shared values of community care and and autonomy and self-sufficiency, which is really loud out here. That is the culture of this place. Now, unfortunately, th- those sentiments can be sidelined and pushed into more divisive places by the people who are interested in that, if you're not careful. So we just try to feed and nourish those sentiments that are about us taking care of each other, you know? Yeah. And like a wider sense of definition of each other that's not, that doesn't play into the, yeah, tropes of like, well, these are outsiders. They just, their people are from south of the border, like blah, 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 or whatever. They're from a city. Yeah. Yeah. But that being said, a lot of the volunteers who've been coming to drive supplies out to other places are locals, um, all kinds of people, you know, like there's obviously people who are tapping into our distribution network that might normally be doing more of like a church type charity, but are coming and helping us and spreading stuff around. And so I have seen a lot more community participation this time than in the past. Cool. That's yeah. I mean, this has been such a like a huge a hu- it's, it seems to have had such a huge impact on the whole region that for people not to pull together would be kind of ridiculous. Yes. And right, right, right. Um, yes, we just have to make it through the next phases. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience of the storm in the immediate mm-hmm. grassroots sure. response to yes. like yes. those existing infrastructure and relationships mm-hmm. that folks already had. Mm-hmm. How did that create the response to need and, and shape your response? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm so interested in talking about this because I've learned a lot from this about what the holes are in our networks and capacity to respond. And I'll say that what I didn't say at the beginning of this is I live at the top of a mountain off the grid. I have Starlink. And so we didn't have much wind event. We didn't have flooding. And so um, we were less impacted than many people uh, given this. So I will say Thursday night, we all of our little roar close group checks in on our signal threads and check in on everybody. We talk about our plan for the next day and we plan to talk later. Then in the morning, check in again, winds picking up, everyone checks in, and then we go to bed. You know, that day everyone's a little stressed and checking in there. But the next day was radio silence. We could get out. We were getting information from the outside world because we had Starlink and because we had um, service and we had lost power because we're on solar. And our Starlink can be a little spotty because it's a pretty deep holler up there, but it's still uh, better than nothing, right? And it's not tied to the electrical grid. So we didn't know how anyone was doing. None of us could communicate with each other. None of us knew how each other were doing for 
at least a day for some, in some cases, two days. And so um, I think the second, like, so like that Saturday, we took care of stuff at the house. The next day we drove into downtown, tried to get to downtown Marshall. It was closed off at that point and to assess the flooding and take some pictures to send people and to try to get some messages, see who we could get a hold of. Fortunately, you know, a lot of the damage out here was trees down in the roads. And there are so many people who are chainsaw competent. And so just like the citizens of Madison County just cleared the roads up, you know. And I know that from what I heard, it was easier to get around here than it was Asheville for several days because of people not only removing the trees, but collecting firewood from it. Because that's what that's how it is. This is a subsistence type lifestyle that so many people are used to here where they collect the resource as it falls. You know, it's like a literal windfall. The tree is there. You collect the wood. And so we didn't even have to use a chainsaw except to get out of our driveway, get to town. We're still the only people we can hear from. At a certain point, people start leaving their abodes and going to check on each other physically in cars. And so the the topography of this place is important to remember because we're so separate from each other, even when we're close, because it's like from the, the mountains and valleys create a topography that is difficult to navigate here. And I should say that Roar, we all have, uh, or a lot of us have the Baofeng radios, and they did not work in this situation. They did not help. Is that because of the, like I've heard Margaret Kiljoy talk about this on other podcasts about Mm -hmm. the amount of um, moisture in the air messing with the radio waves slash the topography, or because, like I'm sure you'll practice, but uh, Baofeng's are really complicated. (laughs) Like I'm not, (laughs) and I have two, and I could definitely, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's a good question. I had assumed it was mostly topography, um, but I'm not sure. Because I was talking, we have friends at Bulbancha Liberation Radio um, down in New Orleans, Bulbancha, and they talked about how they're able to set up the mobile Starlinks there and get around and get everybody's service. But like here, that's not an option because it really has to have almost like visual. Yeah, um, sight. Mm-hmm. yeah, it has to be in sight. So, you know, this like not being able to communicate with people, was, was alarming. It took us a couple days for everybody. To, we kind of just all checked on each other and our neighbors for a couple days. And, but still, and I will say this too, that like, this was true outside of the larger region too. Like it was really interesting to be at, at this like top of the mountain off grid, but with the only person with communication capacity, we saw right away that we needed to start giving updates to the outside world. Um, my partner and I, Dave, and we were fielding say like health and safety checks from strangers trying like being like, please, can you go see someone on this road? Like, you know, people that we do know who ha- wanted us to check on everyone they knew around here. Like it was like kind of being inundated with questions and, and it made me just see like how reliant we are on constant contact with people, you know, but by Monday here in Madison County, we had had a meeting scheduled for that following Wednesday. That was just a regular meeting. And we were like, all right, we got to move it up. <laughs> and so we met on Monday with Roar and then any affiliate friends and people who were interested in working on the response effort. And by Tuesday had a hub set up, you know, and we're receiving donations, putting out communications, dividing up the jobs. And, you know, of course, mutual aid disaster relief has a lot of different hubs around and, and there are people who are just organizing communication between the hubs. So I will say that their existing network and our existing connections and capacity for working together and already having had experience with this kind of thing has been really helpful. And then also we have medic, we have people with medic trainings, we have people who are comfortable using ATVs because we were having to do health and safety checks on ATVs, get medications delivered to people off-road in certain parts of Yancey County specifically. Madison was much less hard hit. It was not hit as hard at all as Yancey. Yancey got like 30 inches of rain in one day or something. And so those immediate needs, we, we were able to get to pretty quickly because we already had the relationships and we already had methods of communication and getting things done you know, and people willing to do that work, uh, obviously. But I I can't really overemphasize how important it is to already be working on community care and networks of distribution and support before something hits the fan, you know? Yeah. So even if you don't know what, like, it's good to have ideas of what is, you know, possible or what is likely to happen Mm -hmm. so that you're prepared for it. But even just having the ability to have those conversations in the run up to a situation like that, means that if the situation's different, at least you can pivot with those people that are in communication right. still over to whatever that is that need is. And then you can all reach out to your connections that um, mm-hmm. make sense in that context. Yeah. So I've, I've been hearing different things and, and uh, you know, uh, I think the water is still in the process of being tested. 
but I've been yeah. hearing different things about the reality of, of the um, possible chemical spill from the um, mm-hmm. PVC pipe manufacturing in Woodfin on Riverside. Um, yeah. And if, yeah, so that's like, again, for the listeners that don't know, that's upriver of Woodfin and Madison mm-hmm. County. It's north right. of, but downriver of Asheville because of the way right. the river flows on the French Broad uh-huh. specifically, um, or or other sort of sources of um, chemicals that would mm-hmm. have entered into the water. That's now the mud. That's now the dust that's blowing around. Right. That's affecting right. residents and cleanup efforts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can speak to that a bit. As you mentioned, there's already a lot of unknown. I mean, there's still a lot of unknowns. So. And, you know, there's a good bit of conspiracy talk around this, but it's hard to get answers around the water testing and the soil testing. But some people who have been working with it more and seem somewhat knowledgeable of it, it's clear that the dirt, the sludge on the island, at least, which is what I'm and downtown Marshall, which is what I'm more used to people working with, is gross. <laughs> it smells bad. Um, there's like a rainbow color in it. Like the, you'll see some rainbows in certain areas. Like it looks like a fuel, you know, um, and that plastics manufacturing, you know, they make PVC and stuff. And so they just had vats of nastiness, you know, that, and that place was destroyed. So we can only presume that they went into the water, you know, and on top of that, and I think this gets emphasized less, but you know, it's this like an, a river arts district was flooded full of chemicals and solvents because artists use chemicals and solvents often. We got woodworking stuff, Um, I'm not trying to make it equal to the manufacturing of a plastics place, but like it all adds up. And, you know, even in lesser floods here on the French Broad River, you'll just see like giant house size propane tanks floating by or like uh, our little RVs, little campers (laughs) will float by. I mean, the the place is just going to be full of chemicals, even if there hadn't been the one bigger dump that was the plastics manufacturer. Um, And there has been some report of mild chemical burns from people who touched the sludge. And that was before people were using the PPE. Now people are pretty solid with the PPE, but for a while it wasn't like that. And I know that before they started like wetting down the dirt in downtown Marshall, the inhaling it was not great. People are having some like lung issues who inhaled it because it was really dusty and dry and, and that, that stuff is in there. So I think that, I know there's been a lot of efforts to like promote the French Broad as like a clean river in the past 10 years. And like, honestly, having lived around here for a long time, I'm always shocked when I see tubers, people tubing in the river and stuff. Um, but I always like kind of thought of it as a little gross because it used to, you know, there was a bleachery on it in Swannanoa and like I, all these things. But, um, but yes, there is a chemical dump that happened in there. I mean, it's also just true that the water level was really high. It was diluted a good bit and moved, you know, moved onto the Gulf, which also is terrible, right? But I don't want to downplay that there's full, that it's, there are chemicals in there, but I will just say like there's a lot of emphasis on one spot when I think that gosh, who knows how much how many chemicals from other areas that flooded are in that were in that water and they're definitely in that dirt and it will take a while to figure that out i mean to see what the residual effects of that are and that is frightening and i I honestly worry more about like all of the other animals of the riparian system as well you know what about all of the hellbenders and the other salamanders and the the fish you know special plants that live along the river and so i i do i do have that concern around the toxicity of the of the spill but i also i mean of the flood and the toxic spill within the flood and also, it's just hard to hold it all at one time, you know? It's hard to think of all of these things and to hold space for that. And I also fear that we could have, like, a pretty big outbreak of a psychogenic illness where people are worried that you produce the symptoms you think you might have, you know? Um, so I try to be careful when I talk about it as well. But, yeah, I do think the water is full of, was full of some nastiness and, and the, the dirt around the flood zone is full of nastiness as well. Now, I don't think it's actually going to be like condemned. There was there were definitely like memes or like um I text alerts going around about how downtown was going to Marshall was going to be condemned. I don't think that's happening. But I will say that probably there will be some longer term damage to the environment, maybe more than to the to the humans walking around there. So no no Centralia moment for <laughs> I don't think we're going to have a Centralia moment. I don't think so. Um... Yeah. And so, like, the PPE that, like, people kind of upgraded from just, like, rubber sole boots and, and whatever mm-hmm. to, like, Tyvek boots, uh, Tyvek suits, and, like, v- v- is it VOC, like, volatile organic 
um, com mm -hmm. compositions. Compounds. Of compounds. Yeah. Ventilators when they're doing mucking. Yeah, people are doing full on respirators and um, Tyvek suits. Some people are just doing like gloves and respirators with night with better covering clothes, but not necessarily Tyvek. Um, you know, because there's some people doing the cleanup every day, digging up the sludge every day. We've had an incredible volunteer response for downtown Marshall, like, and there's folks coordinating that, but um, over out of Nanostead where they like help you get your PPE on, and there's a shuttle that takes you downtown to help with the cleanup and bring you back. Like, it's really beautiful. All of that is really wonderful to see and the people have just integrated putting on the PPE as part of the process you know can you talk a little bit about what the government responses looked like sure. and like I've heard people talking in the area about like oh there's a lot of soldiers around here or like a lot of military people <laughs> yes. in the area and lots of like yeah. you know there are conspiracy theories about FEMA taking people's property and whatever yes but like yeah I wonder if right. you about that a little bit sure I'll do my best. You know, the local government response, like the county and the city, um, at least here, were, they're pretty on it and seem solid. They've set up some pretty ma big distribution centers. I mean, I will say that I've heard that both their distribution sites and any that are more federally connected are starting to get kind of like skimpy and limit how much they let people take. And it seems like they're like planning to shut down in not very long. So I will say that, like I, I can say they're around now. I don't see them being here long term. And that's just also from former experience. But I don't know anything about the state, North Carolina state at all. And so I was thinking about this at the different levels, and I'm just really not sure about that. That might be longer term. The federal response took a little while, as always. And I mean, something that some of us were talking about with Roar was that you know, when you have this big bureaucratic machinery, it's just like the inertia to get anything done quickly is just... It's, it's very hard for them to move quickly, right? And so those of us that are doing more decentralized care, I mean, even like the, the giant bureaucratic aid organizations aren't here. You know, Red Cross is not here because it takes a while, you know, for anything that's like a big machine to get it moving. But when you're decentralized and you can plan quickly and dispatch resources quickly, collect resources, liquidate them, move them around. Um, you can just move more quickly. So I will say the federal response has taken a while, but I don't think it's out of neglect. I mean, like, I don't have a dog in the fight uh, about blaming this on the administration or whatever. Um, I find it annoying and distracting that that is happening. But I can say that it's never surprising to me when a giant bureaucracy takes a minute to do something. Now, Yes, it's there. It almost feels like a military occupation on the island. Like the army is here. There are other places. I think the National Guard. So that's a part of the state branch, I guess, because there's different versions of the National Guard. The National Guard was in Yancey County and Mitchell County. Um, that response, I think, depends a lot upon the specific people, personnel involved. These seem to be very, very young people who don't know how to do many things and are, have trouble organizing. And from what people I know who went there said, including my family, you kind of had to boss them around and explain to them how to do things, you know, be like, you need to do this now and then go do this and then set this up. And then they would do it. But it was like, that was the chain of command was like locals <laughs> coming in and being like, excuse me, I'm going to tell you how to run this line, you know, whatever. But usually this is such a weird thing to say, but honestly, this, it was like this in New Orleans because I was also there after Katrina, before and after Katrina, I wasn't there for the actual storm. The National Guard can feel so incompetent that you're almost grateful when the army shows up because they have a chain of a command and they understand how to do things. And like, they're just like at work doing their operations. And so on the island, they are moving a lot of stuff around. They have a ton of equipment and they're, it feels more like an engineering project and that problems are being solved there. I can't speak to what they're doing other places. But the things that actually kind of require a higher level of equipment that we can't afford, um, I'm grateful to see the people bringing those in and dealing with that. You know, like we need the backhoes and all of the dirt movers, you know, <laughs> of the world right now. So that they are there doing that. And that feels important to me. You know, I don't know how long there will be government attention to this area. That That's a big question. Yeah. And so like the what I was imagining, a lot of those military uh, like the military that was present is that there were probably Army Corps of Engineers and that there yes. would be like, yeah, as you said, like moving earth, clearing roads, like maybe laying down gravel, right. um, restoring uh, electrical infrastructure or yes. removing damaged electrical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The island is like, it's a good staging ground, if you, especially if you've got yes. access to the other side because it's a big flat area that's like separate from the right. road. And there's a, I guess, a water filtration plant, but an electrical generation plant yes. at least that was upriver 
um, yes. of their just uh, like a f- quarter mile or something less than that. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So that's a good staging ground for them to be. No, it's a it's a good location and it makes sense. It's just alarming when you go there. You're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 right. I just wanted to go water my plants. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So as autumn sets in and this mm-hmm. you know this situation reaches reaches into the third week since Helene. What needs do you see recovery and community responding to? And does mm-hmm. this dovetail with the ongoing challenge of marginalization of rural working class communities right. and the work that Roar has already been engaged with, like with, for instance, mm-hmm. the wood distribution, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so grateful we already have the wood distribution set up and highly encourage people to do that if you live somewhere rurally. Like giving people firewood is a, such a it's a great way to build community and have pe- establish com- connections with people you might not normally connect with. Um, we're definitely amping, amping up our firewood collection and hopefully like solidifying some like multiple levels of response for delivery. And then, you know, right now, so we're losing our space. We had someone donate a little space, but it's, we've already outgrown it. And also like, they're kind of ready to get back to normal and it's pretty wild in their parking lot right now. <laughs> so we're going to lose this space, but we are looking for a bigger one because what's clear is, I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like that the more like government organized donation sites and pickup sites are, they really limit how much people can have. They seem to be shutting down and we're expecting people to have a hard time all winter. If they make it through their emergency unemployment <laughs> situation, which is a, a mess, if they make it through the FEMA hoops and all of that, you know, it's just a lot of bureaucracy to navigate. These these are multi-generation households out here too. And there often will be like a limit per household on aid. And at least that's how it was after Katrina. Like, and you know, after Katrina, New Orleans is amazing because there were so many generations living together in some places. And then they would really limit how much money they gave those people because they were thought they were lying that they lived together. You know, they would only let like one or two people use each address anyway. So I've seen that already. And that is also the case here. There will be like one address with multiple structures on it. Right. And people just like because property tax is so insane out here and people can't afford to buy a place. You just put another little unit on your land. Or because Um, like elder or child care being a response to families. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. More collective care is happening. And, yeah, those multi-generation families, you have child care, you have elder care, all of that in one place. You're not going to put your old folks up somewhere else, send your children off. You know, yeah, exactly. Like the the kinds of like kinship structures that can be really helpful for all kinds of people, including immigrant communities, also are going to have a hard time getting through some of this FEMA stuff because um, same thing, like multiple, many people in one household. Um, but anyway, the resources are going to be limited that are coming from governmental structures. And so we are seeing a need to maybe have a larger warehouse space. It's a, we're looking for a larger space to actually keep, because people want to give us so many supplies. They really want to give us supplies. And that's wonderful. And also we just have such limited space and we don't know how long we're going to get to be in the one we are right now. And so we have to really be picky about what we're accepting, knowing full well that in a month people are going to need all these diapers and everything that we don't have room for right now. So we're hoping to get a bigger space, but I think that anybody doing this this kind of like support should be keeping in mind the long term and that who knows when people are going to be able to go back to work and have income around here. You know, you know, Madison County, which was hit not as bad, like people have a lot of canned food put up. They have like their deer meat in their freezers and stuff. If they didn't lose it, some of them probably lost it when they lost power. Um, but, you know, in Yancey, people lost and Mitchell, people lost whole houses. They lost everything. And so in those spots, I don't even know what's going to happen. You know, hopefully um, the push to have folks that have Airbnbs to help support people by letting them stay there is going to help because there's a lot of vacation rentals out here, you know. So housing is also going to be a priority and there's other groups working on that. Yeah. So I don't know. That's more I'm thinking more about like, yeah, maintenance of like survival needs over the winter, firewood. And so in those counties that were the hardest hits, housing. Yeah, and so it seems like like if there are folks in communities that are outside of the immediately impacted area of the mm-hmm. storm, that collecting goods in as a part of a hub, and then if you've got the space to store it, and then waiting for those sort of yes. perennial yes. needs like diapers or yes. mm-hmm. fuel or whatever else, right. maybe don't mm-hmm. store a whole bunch of fuel. But um, <laughs> is not a bad idea, and then someone can drive it in every once in a while, but then. In the in the meantime, sending funds that are liquid and can yes. turn yes. into goods as needed. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's been really helpful because there's certain things, you know, we have been getting a lot of donations. It's been wonderful um, of supplies, but also of cash. And, you know, when no one's bringing me fire extinguishers to send home with these like propane heaters and stuff like that, like I can run to Lowe's and just get a bunch of fire extinguishers. You know, it's been really helpful to do that and to have that capacity to be flexible in the needs, you know. So you've already mentioned like some things that have been helpful for you all, like extending your networks over time. Like I know that you were doing like multilingual dinners and yes. um, just mm-hmm. get togethers generally that are socializing as well as filling the immediate need. I mean, sort right. of like a, a slightly more upscale, <laughs> more upscaled and more rural version of a food not bombs in some ways, right? Yeah. There's a lot mm-hmm. of the people, like there's not a lot of houseless folks in a lot right. of parts of Madison County because there's no Places Place to be. People. Yeah. But, and then the, the, you know, wood exchange or the, you know, the, the wood giveaways and deliveries of wood and medications and such. Um, are, do you have any other tips f- mm-hmm. um, for preparation for folks of the possible or inevitable climate catastrophes and, and failure of infrastructure that's accelerating around us? Like, it seems like having, yeah. and having these networks you've said is already like a good first step because then you're building off of something. Yeah. I, I think establishing the network's is a good idea, establishing relationships, learning to trust the people that you work with, building, learning to work through conflict, communicate with each other, like have different opinions, like all these things are really important. Learning how to speak to each other kindly as you talk about things that are stressful, you know, Um, because when you're under acute stress, like we have been the past week, it's easy to get bitchy and snap at people. And if you haven't already figured out how to tone that down, (laughs) not be reactive, it's not going to go as well, you know? Um, And so there's that, that kind of stuff for sure. Definitely trying to do outreach and work with other groups and meet needs as need be. We do a lot of, we're pretty good at fundraising. So we do a lot of fundraising for other groups, which means that, so like we helped restore the historic black school in Mars Hill, gave some money towards that. We helped uh, save a um, historic black cemetery that there was a property dispute over, things like that. So it's also just like when you can make some cash, spread it around. That's really helpful for a lot of groups that are less high profile, you know, and that's that's what we're doing right now, too, because we've been able to raise money rather quickly. And so we're redistributing it to the groups that are not able to do that, including undocumented folks. In fact, I'm just like when they talk about the government giving all the money to undocumented people, I'm like, are you serious? Like no one is helping these people. You know, like this is <laughs> this is where we have to come in and try and get some resources to these communities, you know. And I would say like one group that we work with and help out who are doing a really amazing distribution site is uh, Poder Emma, which is an Emma, uh, which is kind of like an interesting little rural enclave next to Asheville. And they're doing amazing work. So I definitely want to, you know, say that they are worth talking to, too, probably for you. Um, but they're doing a similar like distribution thing, but with definitely sort of in the Latin community and um, building up relationship over time where you share resources and you show that you're willing to sacrifice for other for all kinds of people (laughs) and give and donate especially if you're good at getting money which sometimes people some people are better than others you know I mean you know even doing this kind of interview is not for everybody right and so uh, I would say like doing all the network building building trust trying to identify your region specific strengths and weaknesses you know like understand like me being like okay People will get out here with chainsaws and clear the roads before we even talk about it, you know, and I can probably get a lot of people who don't use wood heat to collect firewood and bring it to me, you know, like these kinds of resources of the strength being wood heat, leaning into that, leaning into people's skills with um, processing firewood, all those kinds of things, you know, so and also what are the weaknesses here? Weaknesses are we're all very isolated. (laughs) Even when we live next to each other, it might be a white, it might be hard to get there. And making safety plans for keeping your community intact and checking on each other. You know, like we definitely saw some things fall through. Like, yeah, we didn't, I didn't practice the radios. And also, yeah, every topography has its own issues, right? And the strength of this place is self-sufficiency, community care, all those kinds of things that are like really entrenched in the culture here. But the weaknesses uh, can also be not trusting outsiders sometimes, you know, and that can be a strength because I'm hoping that keeps people from being preyed upon by disaster capitalists and real estate speculators who are already here doing the thing that they do, which is snap up land. I'm hoping that protectionist vibe is going to protect those people and help them not sell their land. Um, I think it probably will, but also 
it can sometimes mean like not always sharing with outsiders when maybe we should also be accepting other people into the community right now because we're less hard hit than other places, you know? So yeah, assessing what are the, what are the issues most likely to happen where, where you are? And in some places that'll be wildfires, right? In some places that's going to be like one hurricane after another in more of a flat zone. The ongoing stress of the extraction industries, especially like fuel extraction, like the fact that the whole Gulf is basically like this sacrifice zone, the Gulf Coast to, and understanding that pressure accelerating everything, you know? So I think that I've been pretty inspired by some of our community down around Bulbancha, New Orleans, and their disaster preparedness. Um, the folks at another Gulf is possible are doing a lot of awesome work. And they have that, you know, they're figuring out a lot of communication stuff because their communications go down regularly, right? <laughs> and so their um, Bulbancha Liberation Radio is making these mobile Starlink units that are solar powered and they can just drive them around and get uh, radio and phone service to people. And like that is huge. And I think that if people were going to build autonomous hubs, we should have that capacity. We could have gone and set up at Ingalls and saved people so much stress, you know? So I definitely encourage anybody raising money or putting together resilience networks right now to invest in some communications apparatus for sure. Yeah. Yeah. As he said, like situations and preparedness are going to look a lot different in different geographies mm -hmm. and technologies are, are always shifting and developing. So, but right. That's yeah. It. Totally. Good, yes, for sure. Being prepared and, and just learning what's available, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You've listed a few groups already, but are there any other groups that you want to shout out? Oh, I hope I don't leave anyone out. Um, <laughs> I mentioned National Tool Library again, but I want to say they provided a service and they're still providing it that I think is so amazing. They set up engine repair tents and they did that in Marshall and they're doing it. I think they did it in Yancey, but they actually like set up hubs where people will work on your chainsaw, work on your little, your small engine repair and help you get your chainsaw ready so you can work on your land, you or know? Generator or like, yeah. Or your generator. And yeah, because people's generators often sit around for years at a time. And so they have been working on that. That is an incredibly useful offering. That kind of thing should absolutely be in your network if you're trying to create a network of support. I mentioned Poder Emma already. And I think also, so the building, the communicate, the connections between different groups is so important. And then I would say the... I'm trying to think of who else. I talked about holler harm reduction. I want to say their name again because I have no idea where we would be this week if it wasn't for them. Really, really indispensable support there. I'm sure that I will be after this be like, ah, what about those people? But um, Firestorm is also an awesome, awesome resource uh, helping people figure out what's going on on the ground. And I can check in on their page. Like having updated communications where you're like, this is what's happening on the ground here. Here's what's being offered. Honestly, Blue Ridge Public Radio has been quite helpful. Like their updates are helpful. And so, you know, as someone who has been, pe someone people are looking to to update the rest of the continent, <laughs> which is part of my job right now, it's been helpful for me to glean that information from other sources. Um, and Firestorm has obviously been really useful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, cool. If you think of any other groups in the next few hours and you want to send me a <laughs> okay. link, then that's great. Um, okay, cool. Where can people learn more about Roar and uh, possibly like send donations? Yes, for sure. We have a website, Rural Organizing and Resilience. If you just put that in, it should come up as a WordPress site. It might just be .wordpress.com, but I can't remember right now. Um, we're on Instagram at WNC Roar. There's a underline space somewhere in there. I'll share this stuff with you because you maybe have show notes. But we also have Patreon if you want to help the work through the winter. Um, we, we, you know, we have Venmo and PayPal, although, gosh, sometimes those are difficult services to work with, but we're working it out. That's the main way you can keep up with us. Uh, I've been trying to do regular updates for us on social media. Uh, it's not always fun, but I'm doing it. And yeah, that's the main thing I would say. I'm hoping that once things have died down a little bit, we could actually start to really compile a resource for sharing with people about what's gone down and, and, um, and help. And also I, I, I just want to emphasize this now that like the racial racist division that's trying, that is being spread by right-wing pundits and um, mercenary politicians who are trying to just use this for, elect, for the election cycle 
is really challenging. It's making our work harder, our people feel less safe going out into the field to deliver, to make deliveries. We're having, we're getting sidetracked by like long discussions when we need to be get on the road because people are, there's just, um, it's of course expe- to be expected that this is how things are going, but it's, but it's stressful. And the folks around here are vulnerable and they're already having a hard time and it's t- all too easy just to blame people besides yourself who don't look like you when you're having a hard time. Yeah, and when Mr. Appalachia, J.D. Vance, decides to talk about, like, who belongs <laughs> in, in Appalachia, yeah. not yes. everyone is, uh, you know, blue-eyed and white-skinned like like him and I. I know. But, like, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of diversity in Appalachia. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And not speak for everyone. Yeah, I know, for sure. So we're going to be working a lot more on messaging around that and trying to, like, dispel some of the... Um, just yeah, the falsehoods that are being spread right now. Yeah. Well, Jana, thank you so much for having the conversation yeah. and the work that you're doing. And um, yeah, I uh, hope to get to share space with you soon. Cool. Thanks, Bruce. It's nice to see you. And now some words from anarchist prisoner, Sean Swain. It's heartbreaking the scenes we see in the devastation zone of Helene. In many places, like Asheville, the world that once existed, the world of roads and schools and malls and homes has been erased. Whole communities were swept away, leaving desperate people without water, food, shelter, or Wi-Fi. Humanitarian aid is flowing into those areas hard as struck, but that's really a fraction of what's needed. Helene was the eighth storm event of this hurricane season. Milton was the 13th storm headed into Florida even as I wrote this. Milton geared up to be a Category 5 storm. On the heels of Milton is the coming winter, while places like Asheville aren't exactly the Upper Peninsula of Michigan when it comes to winter temperatures, the cold is still cold enough to kill those without shelter or winter clothing. So a lot of people face precarious and dangerous circumstances. What makes all of this all the more heartbreaking is the very real possibility that this tragedy and many like it are all preventable, that they are, in a larger sense, self-inflicted. Even now, there are politicians seeking national office who laugh at climate change and say that global warming will simply create more beachfront property. Not only is this dismissive attitude contributing to a course of greater devastation, it's just plain wrong. Rising ocean waters will not contribute to more beachfront property. They'll contribute to less. People saying things like that aren't just stupid. They're full-spectrum stupid. Now, it's true that Helene may have been inevitable regardless of human behavior. That's true. We have no way of knowing. Perhaps Helene was just destined to happen. Or perhaps it could be that cow farts and belching permafrost and melting polar caps and overheated oceans are all now coalescing to build a hurricane factory. I think the frequency of hurricanes lends itself to the latter interpretation rather than the former. I guess how we see it boils down to our cost-risk analysis when viewing the outcomes and how close we are to the actual devastation and whether our most prized possessions are waterproof. When we look at Asheville, we don't just see tragedy and loss. I suspect we see the future, a future that likely confronts all of us. It just arrived in Asheville earlier than a lot of other places, but later than some. The people of Puerto Rico, Haiti, and Cuba still have not recovered from natural disasters, likely fueled in part by human contribution to global warming. Really, not everybody has yet to recover from Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans a decade and a half ago. There is still an underclass of storm victims hidden in the shadows, permanently displaced by that disaster. They represent our collective future also. In a matter of years or months or perhaps weeks, that's all of us sitting on our rooftops, waving at helicopters, standing knee-deep in mud, and watching all of our belongings float away in a contaminated water that will someday kill us indirectly. The stunned shock we see etched on the dirt street faces, the unblinking days we see in their eyes, all of that will someday belong to us. 
if we survive what hits us, of course, if we have any sense, and I'm not sure we do, this could be a moment of clarity, a collective realization, a critical disjuncture where we consider hitting the pause button. A global Asheville looms over us. We can't clear cut it and frack it and drill baby drill it away. All of the indoctrinated knee-jerk responses fail to provide a solution to this crisis, but instead contribute to the crisis. If we do anything at all to undo our otherwise inevitable catastrophic future, we have to stop dragging stones at the side of the pyramid. More, we have to disrupt the pyramid construction scheme, find a way to take it down entirely. That's a lot, and it's a heavy burden to carry. I get it. The prevailing narrative is quite enticing. If we all work hard and contribute and pay our taxes and eat our vegetables, we'll all be co-creators of a future where scarcity is a thing of the past, diseases are cured, and we can live long and happy lives with technology and luxuries that will make us comfortable and safe. That's an enticing promise. The reality is we're going to be knee-deep in the muck, watching those promised luxuries and technologies float away. We'll be building cooking fires and sharpening spears. It seems all roads lead us back to the Paleolithic, either on our own terms or otherwise. Personally, I've long embraced going back to tribal life skipping and whistling rather than kicking and screaming. When I see the scenes from Asheville and elsewhere, I'm reminded of a quote. One of the tribal people on an island where my ancestors originated was resisting the invasion of the Roman Empire, and he observed that the Romans create a wasteland and call it peace. Thousands of years later, we're still staring down that wasteland. That wasteland's been called a lot of things. Today, it's called Asheville. And tomorrow? This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're questioning the promise of a brighter future through progress, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case here's past audio Find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR. P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop. 